Hey everybody, welcome back to our podcast. This is Murder With My Husband. I'm Peyton Moreland. And I'm Garrett Moreland. And he's the husband. And I'm the husband. For this um, week's 10 seconds, I'm going to actually go ahead and steal Garrett's 10 seconds. All right, let's hear it. I'm so sick and tired of sharing the limelight with you. (laughs) Let's hear your 10 seconds. Okay, my 10 seconds is that I got my hair done, finally. It's the first time I got it done in a really long time. And it kind of looks the same, but I did get these little cute blonder pieces in front so if you are listening on podcast go ahead and check us out on youtube so you can see my new hairdo she looks very pretty thank you also an fyi for all our youtube viewers if i'm moving around a lot i'm sorry <laughs> garrett's got the wiggles i do got the wiggles <laughs> Okay, so our case sources are ghostcitytours.com, historicmysteries.com, a show called Handsome Devils Season 1, Episode 2, whereyouat.com, nola.com, YouTube, because Brittany Vaughn does an episode on this and it's really good, and delanairbarlett.medium.com. Okay, let's just get right into this week's story. Let's do it. Our story takes place in French Quarter, New Orleans. We're in the year 2006. So they say this case is one of the most infamous murders in New Orleans history. Okay. Ghost City Tours refers to it as a sad tale of an inspiring poet and her wounded soldier of mental illness, suicide, and murder. They include the quote from Stephen King on their website, Monsters are real and ghosts are too. They live inside us and sometimes they win. Wow, okay. Our case starts. Detective Tom Morovic with the New Orleans Police Department responds to a scene that's been ruled a suicide. A young man had jumped from the seventh floor of the Omni Royal Orleans Hotel onto the top floor of the neighboring parking garage on October 17th, 2006. The coroner's office, in an attempt to identify the person, starts rummaging through the pockets on the clothes and come across a small plastic baggie with a folded piece of paper and some military dog tags. The dog tags had the name Zach Bowen on them, and the piece of paper had for police only written on the outside. Oh, okay. The note stated that Zach had to take his own life because of the life he took which he went on to explain meant he had killed his girlfriend and in return killed himself as well. There was an address written on the note and some gate keys to an apartment inside Zach's pocket. Police head directly to the address written on the note. They talk to the landlord and discover that the home belonged to their victim, Zach Bowen, and his girlfriend, Addie Hall. Oh, no. Once inside, police stumble upon an eerie scene, and I will put up the photos of this house on our social media so you can see the magnitude of this case. Or if you are watching YouTube, they will be included right now, so I would highly suggest doing that. The apartment was disheveled from first glance. Police notice the temperature is set to a brisk 60 degrees and on full blast. Whoa. They await the suspected but undesired smell of decomposition that they think they are, you know, mm-hmm. going to run into, but are surprised to not find any mm-hmm. hint of rotting flesh. I would, by the way, that's something I would do is turn the air that low just because I'm always hot. Oh, oh, not if you killed not someone. You're killed just you. saying in general. I'm just saying like that's not super suspicious okay, to me. Okay, because, okay, okay. You know 60 saying? degrees? Yeah. That's pretty low. It is pretty low, yes. But, okay, I get what you're saying. Mm-hmm. It's not until police discover the writing on the walls of this home that they feel the eerie devastation that is this case. That's freaky. Spray painted in a silver color is the words, I loved her in one spot, total failure in another, call Lana Bowen on another wall. What? I'm sorry I couldn't finish on the bathroom wall, help me stop the pain on another wall, And finally, across the top of two walls, look in the oven. As I'm sure your stomach just dropped, whoever is listening to this right now, so did the investigators. Police make their way over to the oven where they were just instructed to look. But when they get there, don't look is spray painted on the oven door. The crime scene photos honestly look like a purposely decorated haunted house. Like that's how scary it is. It's like, it's just like, like it's like a game. Yeah, what the heck? We are now going to bounce back 11 years to the summer of 1995 where teenager Zach Bowen is with his dad on a road trip across America. Okay. 
Zach was known as a charismatic kid. He was born on May 15th, 1978 in Bakersfield, California. He was funny, charming, confident. His parents were always free spirited. They traveled the country with their two boys because Zach had a brother and they ended up in Seattle, Washington. His mom eventually files for divorce and leaves her husband back behind in Seattle just because the dad wasn't ready to um, like finish traveling Mm -hmm. and being free spirited. But the mom was like, okay, we've got two kids now. And like, we need to be serious. Okay. Zach was class clown. He was six foot 10, which he was super insecure about. That's tall. Yes. Very. But he was still, he was was popular though, but he he did have some insecurities. His feet were big. He was super tall. Did he play any sports? I don't think so. That's the first question. I I know. (laughs) Gosh, I'm a typical guy. Every single tall person who's listening to this. I know they hate me right now. As if they don't get that question 50 (laughs) times a day. Oh, did you play basketball? So Zach wanted to move back with his dad at this point, but his mom was worried as Zach's dad was still a partier, still a free spirit person, but she allowed Zach to go as Mm -hmm. he was probably, you know, more like his dad than her. And she didn't want to, you know, crush his dreams. So he leaves high school. He drops out Okay. on this road trip. um, When Zach and his dad, they come across New Orleans and Zach decides, Hey, this is where I want to stay. I like the carefree atmosphere. I feel like this is my heart. Like this is where I'm supposed to be. Okay. So his dad's like, yeah, have fun, teenager Zach, and takes off without him to continue road tripping. Whoa. And Zach stays back in New Orleans as to a teenager. The, as a teenager, which is what okay. the mom was talking about. Yes. When she was saying, your dad's such a free spirit. Uh-huh. Zach lands a job in New Orleans pretty fast. And it's at a walk-up bar. He's like a bartender as, as like a 17-year-old. Wow. Yeah. And he meets a woman named Lana who was a dancer from Texas. She was immediately attracted by his easygoing and fun personality. Zach convinces her to move to New Orleans and she, cause she was just visiting when Mm. they met. And so she decides, okay, "Okay, I'm going to move. So they begin dating right away. And Lana quickly and accidentally becomes pregnant. Keep in mind, Zach Mm. is only 17, 18 years old and Lana was 27. So when she finds out how old Zach is, she's like, you know, what the heck? She breaks up with him and tells Whoa. him, you know, I'm going to have this child anyway, but do not feel pressured to be in this child's life. You are just a kid yourself. Like, I don't want you to feel pressured to like grow up and, you know, do this with me. That's a hard age gap at that age. Cause uh-huh. yeah, that's just it's a hard. pretty big age gap. Mm-hmm. She doesn't think that it's fair really for him to have to do this. Yes. So Zach says nonsense and asks Lana to marry him. He's like, I'm going to raise this baby with you. We're going to be a family together. Okay. Hold on. I'm sorry, and I'm sure everyone's going to be mad, but is anyone else wondering, and this just hit, what's in the oven? <laughs> or is that just me? <laughs> We're going to get back to it. Be patient. Because <laughs> I just realized, I don't know if they opened I left the, you on a Yeah, they didn't hanger. open the oven. Well, it said don't look. It's true. Okay. So in May of 2000, Lana and Zach have another child. And at this point, it's hard on both Zach and Lana. Zach needs a better job, you know, now that they have another mouth to feed. So he decides to join the army and he immediately gets deployed. Now I have the utmost respect for those who put their lives on the line to serve us and our country. Mm -hmm. We need to openly talk about how hostile and mentally destructive it can be to serve in the military when people want to kill you and you can watch your greatest friends, you know, who serve next to you die. It is mentally hard. Like what these, Mm -hmm. what our soldiers and go through is insane. Mm -hmm. The fact that they do this. And so a lot happens while Zach is in the military. Okay. Um, Children that he became friends with overseas are turned around and killed for talking to an American, which is him. And that hits hard on him. One of his best friends was killed He had to have surgery on his feet because they were so big. It really hurt to put him in the military boots and his wife, Lana, who eventually does move over to be closer to him, was not accepted by the other military wives on base. And so there was just drama with that. And so this goes on for years and he did very well in the military. Like he escalated, he was popular, like people liked him, but because of all this pressure of these people dying next to me and these kids getting killed, and it, the relationship is hard with my wife. He purposely begins failing his PT tests in hopes of getting discharged oh, after he had surgery. Okay. So he gets discharged, right? At, to, or he's doing this to try to get discharged and it works. 
He was a good soldier, but he received a general discharge, which means he basically lost all of his benefits because he only. Oh, so it was a dishonorable. It wasn't. It like wasn't a, a dishonorable discharge. It's just called a general discharge. But I read, and they're basically the same thing. Oh. And he had signed like a term, and he was almost to the end of his term, but he literally just couldn't do it anymore. Like okay. it had just eaten him up inside. Mm-hmm. And he had excelled, like I said. So all of his, you know, directors were like, come on, dude, like you just finish your term. Like what's going on? Yeah. And he he's like, oh, I just can't pass my PT test. And so that's why they generally discharged okay. him. When Zach came home from war, everyone in his life says he was different. He was no longer the enthusiastic, rambunctious, like I'm just going to stay here in mm. New Orleans and create a life, Zach, that everyone knew. He's described as damaged, emotionless, empty. Because of this, Lana and Zach quickly split up just six months after Zach returned home from duty. Wow. Zach just wasn't the same person Lana had married or fell in love with. In the summer of 2005, now 27 years old and separated from his first wife, Zach begins working on finding the old charismatic version of himself. He's okay. like, okay, I've, I've gone. I, I really need to start working on this. He gets a graveyard shift as a bartender, which he loves. Like yeah. being a bartender, like he loves it. Mm-hmm. And he does his best to engage with his customers. At this job, Zach turns his eye to a lady who works the shift after his. So she works daytime. This lady was Addie Hall, who we learned about in the beginning was the girlfriend. Okay. Addie was a free spirited bohemian being. She was a dancer, a painter, a poetry writer, a lover of life in the arts. She didn't have a car. She rode her bike around wherever she needed to go. She was kind, funny, a costume maker and very smart. Okay. So think of kind of like, a very happy hippie face. Just go with the flow. Kind of like how Zach was, it seemed like when he yes, first moved. Yes, but on extremely. Okay. But Addie had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and would irregularly take her medication. So this can obviously cause some uncontrolled outbursts at times. Okay. She grew up in North Carolina under an abusive household and she dropped out of high school to travel the country. She would get in. That's cool. Yes. She would get in fights with other bartenders. She could be called violent and a mean drunk, but you know, she really liked to drink and do drugs. Like she was all about that lifestyle. Although Addie could be violent, she could Mm -hmm. get in fights. Zach was immediately attracted to her and began pursuing her. Addie was not about it. Zach thought too hard about people pleasing in her opinion. And, you know, his personality was just too uptight. He was ex-military, way too serious type of person. And keep in mind, Zach was working on becoming more free spirited like he used to be. So this tells you how free spirited Addie was. What's that movie we just watched the other day? The husband was in the military. She was more free spirit. Oh, and they yours, just, mine, and ours. Yours, mine, and it's ours. It's literally is it that, like that situation. Okay. Yes. But he's not He's not actually like that. Yes. He is also free spirited. He's just not as free spirited as Addie. Okay. This didn't stop Zach. Um, he kept trying every day to win her over. And one night it worked. Addie tells her friends that her and Zach are getting very close. And Zach oh, tells wow. his mom, you know, I've met my soulmate. That's what he says. They were both extremely happy and in love. But Zach had been hiding the fact that he had an ex-wife and children. Oh, so she doesn't know this. No. And when Addie finds out about it, she's unhappy. Mm -hmm. But she's like, you know what? Whatever, I'm going to stay with him. Okay. On August 23rd, 2005, Hurricane Katrina made its way to New Orleans and the Mm. devastation turned everyone's lives upside down. And this is in the midst of Addie and Zach falling in love. 80% of the city is underwater. Mm -hmm. 200,000 homes are destroyed. And 1,800 people are dead. I think I was, I was pretty young still, but... I remember it. I remember it. I yeah. remember it. So most people left the city due to the suggestion from the mayor saying we need to evacuate. Like this mm-hmm. is going to destroy the city. But Carefree Zach and Addie are like, you know what? We're going to ride this storm. Like this was made for us. Like oh, okay. we are going to sit here and we're going to ride this out and it's going to be fine. So Zach and Addie are holed up in the apartment for days during the storm. And then... The aftermath is just the two of them there together, helping neighbors around to build, rebuild their lives. And during this time, they are like 
we're thriving. There's no electricity. Oh, there's so they're, they're no just, jobs. They're just loving this. Loving it. They they are doing barbecues, parties out on the ruined streets, like feeding neighbors, feeding oh, people. Wow. Like this is their dr- their dream essentially. Yeah. And because of this, their relationship is thriving. They have no responsibility really. Addie and Zach were even photographed together for national magazines amidst no the way. wreckage and interviewed about their choice to stay in the city and fight and rebuild and just embrace this lifestyle yeah that's kind of cool so falling in love amidst the ruins of new orleans like just a, mm-hmm. a severe hopeless romantic shelly barclay with historic mysteries says the aftermath of hurricane katrina was like a camping trip to the young couple they lived without electricity drank what they had traded booze for water and lived a life without responsibility beyond survival okay But Zach and Addie were neglecting all responsibility while living this no order life. Zach didn't have a phone to call his wife, children or mom, check Uh. on these people who had also just had their lives ruined. Everyone was worried if he had lived through the hurricane and he was too caught up in love to notice. Everyone's like, is he even alive? There's no electricity. There's no phone. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. It's so different. Like with social media and a phone now, you yeah. know if someone's alive because, yes. oh, they posted or, oh, this. You yes. Know? Mm-hmm. And so as time went by and normality was being returned to the city, it caught up to Zach and Addie. Life was coming back to hit them in the face. This little life for only room for the two of them no longer existed. Zach finds work at a grocery store and Addie at a bar again. A month after Katrina, Zach contacts the rest of his family. A month after Katrina hit, he decides to reach out. He apologizes for going missing. And all of this has like, there's a lot of drama involved in this whole situation. Oh, sorry, I was gone for a month. And on the kids too. Yeah. So he's like, I'm sorry I went missing and I will take the kids every other weekend to make up for it. This becomes a problem for Addie. She didn't want the ex-wife to call the shots. She didn't want responsibility. During their off period right after Katrina, with no work and responsibility, Zach and Addie had spent most of their time partying and drinking and doing drugs. And so now, getting back to her life, they were still addicted. So she's like, I don't want these kids. Like, I'm still doing drugs. I'm still drinking. By the time they get back to real life, the drug abuse is real. They are Uh fighting The relationship is spiraling. Zach had jealousy issues with Addie at the bar because she was, you know, trying to make tips, trying to do her thing. Mm -hmm. And all the while, Zach begins suffering very hard from PTSD and depression from the war. Okay. The drugs only making it worse. You think Hurricane Katrina hits, so then there's this disaster. It triggers his PTSD and he's heavily using drugs. Yeah. His emotions are heightened to say the the least. Zach decides that he's no longer going to sit around while Addie parties at work. He begins sneaking out and participating in one night stands of his own. Oh. He begins cheating on Addie, which let's keep in mind, Addie wasn't cheating on him. Yeah. She was just working. And not only with women, Zach announces he's bisexual and begins an affair with a man. And he's going around to the gay bars around okay. the Orleans Got area. It. At this point, Addie wants out. But it's a kind of, I don't want you, but I don't want anyone else to have you type Mm -hmm. relationship. Addie and Zach move into a new apartment together, even though all this is going on above a voodoo shop temple. And Addie secretly signs the lease as only under her name with the landlord. Okay. When they go to move in, Zach finds out and gets mad. Addie says, you can't live here. It's my house. This relationship is beyond toxic, like beyond. They're fighting, they're aggressive, they're physical, they're Uh drugged out, like they're drinking, it's bad. At around 1 a.m. on Thursday, October 5th, 2006, Zach begins strangling Addie during one of their brawls. He strangles her for so long that Addie eventually loses consciousness and dies. Zach is drunk and regretful. He falls asleep next to her dead body on the sofa. Now, this is about to just escalate really quick, and I'm going to give a fair warning. Like, this next thing, I mean, think of everything we have going on, drugs, alcohol, PTSD, a very unhealthy relationship. It's about to get really wild here. Okay. So he wakes up after, after strangling the love of his life. He commits necrophilia with Addie's body and then grabs her diary to write in it. He writes, today is Monday 16th, October 2 a.m. So this isn't really going to make that much sense. I killed her at 1 a.m. Thursday 5 October. So those two dates like don't correlate at all. Okay. 
I very calmly strangled her. It was very quick. He writes, we fought over the apartment. She tried to kick me out and we argued she wouldn't shut up. He writes in the note that he violated the body, which is how we know that he did that. I very calmly, that's the exact word he used, strangled her. Yes. Um, the the notes in the diary was a combination of rage and love like he's going back and forth Mm -hmm. he hates her he loves her because of the heat Addie's body begins to decompose in the apartment and although Zach is strung out he is like ooh it stinks in here I need to get rid of this smell so he sets the temperature in the apartment to below 60 degrees he puts Addie's body in the bathtub and he writes in the journal about how he, you know, I got to figure out how I'm going to dispose of this corpse. Why is he writing all this in the journal? Everything. Or diary. Writing everything in her diary. He calls some friends and tells them, Addie left me and I'm going to go on vacation. Like, let's get out of here. Zach then spends the next two weeks in a frenzy of sex, drugs, and booze. Two weeks. He uses up all the money he saved up. He is so far gone. He calls up Lana, his ex-wife, and says, hey, come party with me. Lana's like, where is Addie? Like, what are you doing? Where is Addie? And he's like, oh, she went back home. We're not together anymore. And Lana's like, no, I'm not coming out. But little does she realize this is the last time she will talk to her ex-husband. Zach is in a psychotic state. He uses a cigarette to burn his body 28 times later writing in the diary that it was for every year of his life that he was a failure. He's only 28. So he's saying that every year of his life he oh, failed. Oh, man. He was doing cocaine, hanging out with friends, buying them lap dances and drinks. This is the last time they would ever see him, though. And he writes later that this last two weeks of his life, he was going to just party, sex, yeah. like live it up, spend all my money and have a good time. Yep. Days later, with investigators, we're now back to the apartment. Investigators just discovered Zach's body, which led them to Addie's apartment. Police are standing at the oven, dreading looking inside. So everyone's gonna be mad because I stopped us right before the oven (laughs) and I'm sure that's what Bane's going towards next. But this is crazy. He just went, he just went for it. And that's what I'm saying. Completely Mm -hmm. AWOL. Like it, it was crazy enough that they got in a fight and he strangled her, but the aftermath was, was intense. Okay, all right. So let's see it. What was in the oven? Police open the oven door and they discover an oversized disposable turkey pan that had what appeared to be two human legs cooked, meaning the skin is now peeled. The skin and muscle is now peeled away from the bone. Oh my gosh. They check the two giant pots on the stove and they find Addie's head in one, but they can't tell it's Addie and hands and feet in the other. Once again, these have been cooked so long that the skin and the meat is completely charred and peeled away from the bone. So it was so that it wouldn't stink, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's, uh, I have no words. Yeah, detectives are in shock. These images being burned into their heads forever, obviously. They check the fridge and they find the torso of Addie wrapped inside a plastic bag. Zach had returned home from his two week drunken spiral and hacksawed Addie's body up in the bathtub. Did no one hear this? I mean, no. I mean, he did it. I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. He then, <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to do it for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. He then decides to cook the pieces to take away the smell of decomp. There is no evidence anywhere that he ate any of Addie's body as he immediately afterwards went to a rooftop bar and jumped to his death with the note in his pocket saying for police only. He wrote in the, in the diary, I scared myself not only by the action of calmly strangling the woman I've loved, but by my entire lack of remorse for it. I've known forever how, how horrible of a person I am. Ask anyone. So he's like, he basically says, I didn't even feel bad for doing it. Yeah. He writes about everything in Addie's diary, eight pages total. I do want to clarify here. Some sources say five pages and also some sources say that police denied the claims about Zach molesting Addie's corpse. Oh, interesting. I'm going to just put that out there because I don't want to give misinformation. So I'm going to give both sides. I still wonder why he wrote all this stuff in the journal. But he wrote in the journal that he did that. So yeah. I don't know how police would No, but have. I mean, in general, like, why did he? Because he right was not there. okay in the head. Yeah. 
Now, I am not excusing behavior, but we do have to be aware of what heavy drugs and alcohol can do to a seemingly normal person. Yes. I'm not saying all people who dive deep into drugs or alcohol will chop up their girlfriend, but it sure can change a person and, and make them do unthinkable things. a mixture things. of PTSD. everything that was happening in the yeah. his time that he this served. This was just a recipe for disaster going yes. on here. Those around the couple and detectives think that it, that that is what happened here. The combination of mental illness, drugs, and alcohol. Tenants above the voodoo temple. So this is, there's an apartment complex above the voodoo temple. Tenants that, not, that lived in the apartments above have consistently reported paranormal behavior throughout the facility since the tragedy in 2006. According to Ghost City Tours, feelings of being watched, voices, and walls mm. pressing in. The apartment where the story of Addie and Zach, a love tale of tragedy, took place is now available to tour as part of Ghost Tours. Oh, so basically their room yes. created a haunted, a, a, a haunted a place. Tour place. I say haunted like this, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if, it's, it was, haunted. if it's haunted. So a lot of residents of New Orleans are upset about this. New Orleans is very well known for their ghost tours, for the rich history that okay. New Orleans have. And it's not always a good history. It's a dark history. There's, yeah. And they accept that. They embrace that. They are upset because afterwards, the people who turned this into a tour went in and added props, added fake blood, like changed uh, the hit, like the site. Changed the story. Yes. To make it scarier. And they're saying this is exploitive of the actual crime. Like, let's, you I know. I can see that. I can see it too. Uh -huh. So, I mean- Ultimately, I hope you all know that we are here to tell the victim's story. I'm here to remember who they were. I do my best to research their lives and tell them. I, along with hundreds of thousands, am fascinated with why people do the things they do. Mm -hmm. That's why we're all here. But it doesn't take away from the consequences that those mysterious actions have, which result in tragedy that we yeah. also are listening to right now. So these cases aren't just stories. They are real victims. Both Addie and Zach were real victims. And let's remember them. Tell those around you that you love them and hug them a little closer today because, you know, mental illness is real and the things that these people go through are real. Yeah, I agree. And so... That is the story of Zach and Addie, one of the most infamous murders in New Orleans. Interesting because it was it was a murder, but it was a murder a, suicide. Yes, mm -hmm. I think that's what it was. I don't think we've done a murder suicide before. I don't think so either. So it was just different. It was it was definitely different. It kind of ended on like a. I know all of them are sad, but this one was yeah. kind of like a well because a it, low note. It's literally just a recipe for disaster. Yes. It went crazy after, mm -hmm. and like I said, Addie. Addie's a victim. Addie was 100% a victim. But Zach was a victim of his own choice too. He right. also died in this situation. There are two victims of a very abusive, toxic lifestyle that these choice that these people chose to do. Now, I'm not saying living free-spirited or bohemian is a bad lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that every single piece that they mixed in, being a toxic couple, abusive, hard drugs, heavy alcohol, it it just created a disaster yeah. for them. No, yeah, that was crazy. I think it's because of what you said. It's, uh, I feel like a lot of the stories that we do, I mean, they're not like this. They don't like, it's not like this ramp up period of they started this and then mm -hmm. they were this. Like, this is all stuff. Like, it was just mental illness. Yes. 100%. It was just a really bad situation. Yeah. I agree. So let's remember Addy. Let's remember Zach and let's love the, those around us a little bit more. Yeah. But we love you guys so much. We do. And if you want to check out our social media, it is Murder With My Husband. We also have Patreon. And like I said, TikTok. It's so fun. It's been fun. We will see you guys next week with another episode. I love it. And I hate it. Goodbye. Goodbye.